Welcome to Season 5 of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we talk with enterprise and technology platform leaders about the people, processes, and platforms that make marketing and customer experience successful, scalable, and sustainable. This is what creates an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom, advisor and consultant for Fortune 1000 marketing and CX leaders and teams as principal and chief strategist at GK5A and best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and Agile certified coach. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. To sign up for the Agile Brand newsletter and get the latest insights and articles on marketing technology and CX, or to purchase a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, go to gregkillstrom.com. You can also find all my books on Amazon and other retailers. And now on to the show. Today, we're going to talk about customer centricity as a shared goal among leaders and employees. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Amanda Ono, VP Customer Experience and People and Culture at Resolver. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really excited to be here. Yeah, looking forward to talking about this uh, topic with you. Uh, so why don't we start by you giving a little background on yourself and what you're currently doing at Resolver. Awesome. That sounds great. I mean, over the past 20 years, I've had a fairly nonlinear uh, career path, you know, working in sales and marketing and then shifting my attention to the human capital side. So really around recruiting, learning and development and performance. And I think in many ways, the nonlinear career path has served to my to my benefit, um, because certainly over the past six years at Resolver, as we've learned to, um, you know, build out our people and culture practice, I, I definitely found I was pulling from some of those past experiences. Then about two and a half years ago, the opportunity to expand my portfolio to include customer experience, which in our world is professional and services, came about. Um, and I thought it was a really good opportunity to uh, expand my portfolio and operationalize um, some of the learnings that I'd had on the people and culture side. You know, you, you build a program then you put it out in the wild. And as an operator, you know, does it, does it land? Does it really hit what you need it to hit? And so it was, uh, that, that brings me to wonderful, today. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And, um, as someone who has had a, a rather nonlinear path myself, I can, <laughs> I can empathize with, uh, the, both the, the value, the, the strengths and, and, and some of the challenges as well of that. Yeah, it's a, it's the jungle gym, yeah. right? It's the career jungle gym, not the ladder anymore. Just bounce around, have fun. Yeah, with it. yeah. You know, there's there's a path. It's just you know, it's maybe not as straightforward as 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 others, right? For sure. So one other thing before we get get into this, for those less familiar with Resolver, do you mind just kind of sharing a little bit about what the company does? Absolutely. Yeah, Resolver is a cruel business. We're doing some really exciting things based out of Toronto. Um, what our platform essentially does is gather all risk data and analyze it in context so people can see the business impact of risk. You know, many risk teams are seen as back office. They're seen as kind of disconnected from the business, but we, we believe risk is really a driver of opportunity and nothing highlighted that more than COVID. I mean, certainly it taught us that understanding risk is a key element of decision-making. We found it in our personal lives as well as business. I mean, certainly using the term risk tolerance probably three years ago around the dinner table didn't happen yeah. a ton. And so we're really proud of what our risk intelligence technology is doing and, and for all the companies we impact around the globe. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, so let's, let's dive in here. First, I wanted to comment, uh, you know, I mentioned your title at, at the top of the show, but I, I think it's interesting that you have both a customer centric as well as an employee centric component to your title. So, you know, given, given that, what is the relationship that you see between the customer and the employee experience? Yeah, I think it goes back to the the adage that if you take care of your employees, they take care of your customers. Yeah. I mean, all of us as consumers have had experiences where you can tell the employee just isn't happy. They don't really like their job and it shows. It shows in the experience that you have. And I really believe that customer facing employees are part of your brand. They're they're the front line. They're often, you know, it doesn't matter how glossy and shiny and beautiful your marketing is. It matters what happens when you have that human interaction. And so, you know, I've always seen those going together and the opportunity at Resolver certainly, you know, gave me to have, uh, gave me the opportunity to have that view. You know, philosophically, as I started building people and culture at Resolver, um, when we were 90 employees in two Canadian offices, I also just always viewed employees as customers. 
you know, when you're building programs, it might make sense for you. But at the end of the day, if it's not well received by employees, it's, it's not really yeah. landing. You know, there's a, there's a philosophical uh, foundation I, I certainly have in terms of how they, they work together. And then just very operationally, you know, if you think of the program pillars that both customer experience and employee experience have to go through, you know, it's recruitment, whether you want to call that prospecting or not, but, you know, recruitment, onboarding, communication, engagement, you know, all of those things are very similar in terms of how you might approach it coming from different perspectives. But, but certainly when you have kind of that whole view, um, you can have a pretty significant impact on where the business outcomes are going. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And I, I I really see the industry moving in this direction. So you know, kudos to you for being at the at the forefront of that. And I think you know, I've I've run across a a very small um, amount of people with with a, a role even even somewhat similar to this. So that's I think that's really great that uh, that that you're able to do that, and you're you know you're you're drawing those those lines and, and those connections. So, you know, given that and um, given what you just said about the the employees being customers in, in and of themselves, why is it why is it so important for everyone? And I mean, everyone from, you know, whether it's top down, bottom up, however you look at it, everyone in an organization to understand their relationship to the end customer. And, and can you talk a, a little bit about how this has benefited Resolver? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, companies exist to serve customers. That's a that's yeah. an easy statement. You know, that's 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 why we're here. But, you know, when you think about what we, you know, what every company does as, you know, how they ultimately serve a, a customer, from my perspective, when an employee feels connected to what the customer outcomes are, they're probably going to be a whole lot more likely to engage in what HR people call discretionary work. And discretionary work is the work that no one really asks you to do, but you do it because you really care. And, and I think there's, you know, a big piece around the customer work when you can articulate to, to people within your organizations, hey, we're not just building a software. We're doing something that's really interesting that's ultimately providing intelligence to, to business or making an impact in whatever way your, your customer base needs an impact. I, I think it just engages people. And, you know, there's some organizations that are able to go really on the nth degree and be extremely values driven about that work. But I, I think regardless, you know, if you're not connecting employees to the outcomes of your customers, you know, there's a point where they might get disengaged. They might feel like a cog in the wheel, you know, and, and I think this has been multiplied certainly uh, by remote work that had happened yeah. uh, that was, you know, forced upon us during COVID. But, you know, how do you create that connection between employee and customer? I think a big thing that we did in our world is just got really good at customer showcases and telling customer stories. Um, it's something I think we can continue to evolve. But, you know, there is um, a point in time where we weren't necessarily threading customer stories into town halls. And I think it's an important thing to do. You know, we, it's the, the customer is ultimately the thing that brings every person together. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a developer or you're in CX or you're in quality engineering or you're in our finance team. You know, at the end of the day, you are driving towards such a great result for, for customers. And I think sharing those successes and, and the true human impact um, is so key to, to really become kind of that vicarious feedback loop between employee experience and customer experience. Yeah, I, I love that really making it practical and, and, and sharing those those success stories. What else would you recommend for whether it's leaders or managers of people? What can they do? What's their role in this relationship between customer and, and employee experience? Yeah, I think, you know, just another another tactical add to, yeah. to, to joining those two things together is also, you know, when a customer goes live for us, we talk about what went, what was behind the deployment. So what was the story that, uh, you know, helped make that customer in a, in a good position, right? So I think that's a key for us that we, we really drive to tell the story. I think what a manager can do tactically, you know, first and foremost, I mean, communication is the thread that goes between the two. And as we're, as we're in team meetings and as we're in one-on-ones, are we asking the question, you know, what are we trying to solve for the customer? Because the answer isn't an implementation. The answer isn't technology or software. It's a change that's bigger. And so, you know, I think for us, one of the big things that 
we really instilled in our leaders and in, in our customer experience team is to go back to understanding what the customer was trying to achieve and highlighting that. I think, you know, so many things uh, that, you know, helps drive leaders to be successful is just repetition and consistency and communication. I think that becomes so key and leaders play a key role um, in, in that, that piece. I think the second thing a leader does is is role model the fact that those things go together. I mean, at the end of the day, when you know you can be great in front of a customer, but are you great with employees? And if those things don't match, you know, you can feel like your leader is perhaps disingenuous because it's not a value that they live. And so I think role modeling is so important because, you know, that it, it works both ways that employees are customers and, you know, customers really are what drives the business outcome. So do we link those things or not? And I think as a leader, as you role model it, um, it becomes such a huge driver to making it successful. Before we continue, I'd like to introduce you to a sponsor of the show, Basecamp. Throughout my career, whether it was at my own agency or now as a consultant, Basecamp is what we rely on to help keep projects on track, on schedule, and on budget. It takes a straightforward approach to project management, it streamlines workflow management, and definitely keeps the team in the loop and on top of ongoing updates, which all are major components in a smooth running operation. No matter if it's a simple campaign or a multi-million dollar project, Basecamp has been a key ingredient in the recipe for a successful project and business. If you're struggling with projects, sign up for Basecamp. Their pricing is simple and they give you all their features in a single plan. No upsells, no upgrades. Go to Basecamp.com slash Agile, that's Basecamp.com slash A-G-I-L-E, and try Basecamp for free. No credit card required and cancel any time. Thank you, Basecamp, for sponsoring this episode. Now let's get back to the show. So, uh, you know, most organizations are going through either some kind of large scale transformation initiative, or they're at least faced with the need for continual change and improvement as, you know, the the last few years certainly are, are evidence of that. A lot of change management is often focused on internal teams and and employees, but customers stand to benefit or or not, you know, perhaps suffer from these changes as well. Um, How do you balance the need for change with managing how that change is going to be handled by customers? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the best built programs that you really care about, you know, and you think are going to drive a huge change, the customer might just gloss right, over right. it, right? I think we, we, we've done that. So, you know, I, I think this comes back to customer empathy, you know, really sitting in the empty chair and asking, does this, does this process benefit us or does it benefit the customer? And I think sometimes when we're going through change, especially at an organization like Resolver that scaled is we, we you know, early days built processes that were really great for us, but they weren't great for the customer. And so I think as we're building things, it's challenging ourselves to ask that question, you know, are we build, who are we building this for and, and what is the outcome? I think the second part of that, you know, beyond empathy is, is recognizing that, you know, we are on a journey. Um, we, we do foster change through technology and there's a lot of steps to walk. So you hope there's not too many detours, but there's a key element of timing. You know, you, you have to understand there's only so much change that any, you know, one individual, whether it be employees or customers can consume. So, you know, you roll out one thing and then maybe you have a, an internal team that wants to roll out the next thing, but does that make sense? And I, I think sometimes those internal timelines and milestones get in, you know, get in the way of a great experience. So I think, you know, we're pretty thoughtful about timing, you know, kind of ask, saying to ourselves, okay, we rolled this out in Q1. Maybe let's just wait. Maybe the next change needs to be Q3. Um, so I, I think we're just very thoughtful when it when it comes to that. But I, I do think, you know, there's a third pillar for us, which is also just being proactive in our communication to customers and kind of letting them know that, you know, as a, as, especially as a software company, but any company, we, we don't want to assume a process that we built six months ago serves them today. 
And so I think there's also a mentality in which we engage with customers to let them know that we are going to iterate, we are going to improve. We might get it wrong occasionally, but for the most part, we're going to get it right. So I, I definitely think it's about looking at those multiple perspectives as you go through change, asking yourself again, am I, who am I doing this for? Does this timing make sense? Um, and then really importantly for the timing, how do I measure um, if, if the timing worked or not um, as, we, as we go through the change? Yeah. And to kind of follow on that, that last piece, you know, how, how do you think about measuring success and not only success of the the effort, the, the whether it's you know transformation or some kind of change, but how do you measure success with your ability to adapt? Um, are there you know are there internal metrics, external metrics? Like what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I you know customer satisfaction is a, is a key part of yeah. this. Um, you know we we measure that very diligently um, at very po- various points in the journey. I think you also you know for us as a professional services organization, we're also looking uh, at metrics like project duration. You know, did the change make the duration better, which then ideally drives adoption. We carry those those metrics and stats through to also look at you know support ticket volume as a really specific example. So, you know, perhaps we implemented a change that allowed duration to go faster, but did the duration going faster mean that we saw more tickets in the support team? Right. <laughs> um, because if that's true, then the metric didn't actually, we didn't drive the right change. Yeah. So I, I think it's also looking at, you know, on from a, a on a continuum, I think is really important. Um, and, and the foundation for me, and I, I can never quite take this hat off, is, you know, employee sat. You know, are we are we hearing from employees, you know, quantitatively or qualitatively that they're feeling burnt out? Change fatigue is a real thing. And, you know, maybe our employees are telling us, like, I just, I just don't, we don't want to do more. And I think sometimes that's where you have to kind of look at the ambition of iterating and growing and improving with the reality of what that means for for the people that are facing customers. And so employee sad is always something I'm 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 going to look at. I think, you know, it's it's easy to build programs that maybe you know, drive customer sat or even, you know, revenue. Um, but if it pulls down employee sat, you know, you're, you're, you're not necessarily spinning the right plate. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's a great segue to, I wanted to get back a little bit to that, the people and culture side of, of your role as well. And anyone looking for talent, managing talent, trying to retain talent can, can probably attest right now the, the employment market is, is let's just say challenging um, to say the least. You know, there's there's low unemployment, skilled workers are in short supply, and yet there's there's a lot of a lot of challenges in the market. How do you think about attracting and, and retaining talent in a, such a challenging market like this? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think as an organization, you have to know who you are and what you offer candidates and employees. And that might sound really simple, but it actually, you know, completely maps to to the customer side. But, you know, you know who you are from an employer value proposition perspective. I always recommend being really honest about it. And then you have to find the employees who want what you offer. And, and I think sometimes maybe companies overcorrect because, you know, maybe Facebook or Amazon has offered, you know, a really great perk or benefit. But if that's not who you are, it doesn't make sense to offer it because it will show up once the candidate gets in the door. And so I think you just really have to root yourself, you know, who are you? What do you offer? Be honest about it. You know, for us in our in our interview processes, we're very open about the fact that we're scaling. So the great news about scaling is there's lots of empty space for people to take initiative and, you know, learn and develop and take ownership on special projects. But of course, the downside of scale is that it's hard and sometimes it's going to feel frustrating. Yeah. And sometimes you're not going to want to do it. So we tell candidates that in interviews. And so what we want is people to opt in. If they want that, opt in. But if you don't want that and you want to be in an organization that's maybe not growing because it doesn't make sense for the period of life that you're in, then, you know, we're probably not for you. And then as an organization, you know, find the employees who want you, who want those things, because every company has different things to offer, you know, both from 
not just a, a total rewards and benefits perspective, but what the organization does. And, and I think the reality that we're seeing in this market is candidates have choice. You know, they don't need to go into an office anymore. Uh, they can work hybrid, men, many of them. And so I think because of that, you have to make sure you're very open and honest about what the choice is going to look like for them. Because there's there's no there's no use in putting pulling wool over the eyes as soon as they're in and within their first three months they're going to see who you are they're going to see who your leadership is they're going to see what your culture looks like so if you're disingenuous about any part of the recruitment cycle I mean you're 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 just creating early turnover which is a massive resource drain in in companies yeah yeah and and so you've kind of you kind of touched on this already with what you were just talking about but. What would you say that companies are are missing in in this equation? And you know, as they're recruiting, you know, whether that's the the recruiters themselves, but you know, as as they're kind of approaching trying to get the right talent. Yeah. So again, this is where the dual hat comes in handy. You know, if you thought about candidates as customers or prospects, and you knew they likely would be brand ambassadors for you or could be, you know, what processes and programs would you build? Yeah. to to deliver a great experience. And I think at the end of the day, you know, if you're to think one of the most common pieces of feedback uh, candidates share in the market is, you know, they're through a diligent recruiting process and then the recruiter ghosted them. You know, yeah. uh, flip flip the script a little bit and challenge yourself to say, if you're in sales and you're going through multiple prospecting calls and the person was interested, but maybe just product market fit wasn't there and you just never spoke to them again, I mean, what would that do? I mean, sales would be jumping up and down and <laughs> really wanting to, you know, uh, make that improvement. And it's the same thing on the candidate experience side. And so, again, you know, com- because candidates have choice, you know, for many organizations that are hybrid or remote, um, that's made that true. You know, you really have to think that you're delivering an experience for them. And truly, if you get it right, it's the first experience for them to become an employee. And so you want that experience to, to really drive towards the long term and, you know, provide opportunities for early engagement in your culture because people that are culture carriers, they stay. Yeah. And, you know, retained employees are very similar to retained customers. You know, the cost of acquiring customer uh, is pretty low when you're just going to an existing customer. It's the same for an existing employee. And so, you know, I think it's sometimes, you know, getting out of getting out of our mindset and thinking about candidates and employees in many of the same regards. Um, and then the programs you build will follow to set you up for success. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, even to build on that as well, I interviewed somebody, this was a couple of years ago now on the show from, uh, he was our employer branding at Kimberly Clark. So, you know, huge company, wide reach sells, you know, a million products that we all use. Um, you know, he approached it and, and, it sounds like they they could actually put numbers to if they if the interview process because you know they had thousands of applicants and couldn't hire everybody that that applied for the job like if if they had a negative experience they're also customer uh, so in that case it's a literal line between you know it, they are they're literally customers and and potential employees or employees that tried to get a job, but even if they get rejected from the job, they're, you know, they're still customers. So it's, it can be, you know, it, it can be quite literal depending on the organization. Yeah, that's, that's such a, that's such a great point. And I mean, you know, again, when you think of what social media has done for candidate experience, I mean, people aren't afraid to call out a bad experience, yeah. right? And so, you know, it can go, it can go both ways. And and certainly, you know, a very high compliment we've received from our customers is they will go to our page where we talk about who we are and who we hire. And, and they've actually said, you know, that is an element we look at when we select a vendor, because if you're building a great culture and you care about it, that's the experience that I'm going to get once once I buy from you. Yeah. And, you know, I've only heard this once, uh, but it was definitely something where I think it would be a sentiment that many customers would share um, if they they dove into it. And I, I, I suspect that person probably had an experience where they worked with a vendor that didn't have a strong culture and they kind of had to eat the, the bad experience and, you know, perhaps poor um, uh, implementation that went with it. But, you know, it was such a great observation in terms of, you know, who you choose to hire and how you choose to engage people. And so I think that message is 
going up, up and down and across the board. Um, so I definitely think it's a key thing to be really be looking at and making sure you care about on both ends. Absolutely. Well, um, one last question before we wrap up here. What's uh, one piece of advice you would have for customer experience leaders as they navigate the months ahead? I think it would be really focusing on empathy. I, I think, you know, the world is still uncertain. And I think sitting in the empty chair, whether you're thinking about your customers or your employees, is so important because change is hard. And when you engage in change, thinking about another person's perspective and, you know, how that perspective will make or break a a relationship, uh, hopefully a long term one is so important. And so I think it's it's a it's a skill that, you know, historically has been under indexed. I think people have thought of empathy as being, you know, oh, you're just too nice. But I really do feel like being strong in terms of empathy from a CX and just broad leadership perspective um, is going to be what moves true business results. Yeah, I love that. Well, I'd I'd like to thank Amanda Ono, VP of Customer Experience and People and Culture at Resolver for joining the show. You can learn more about Amanda and Resolver by following the links in the show notes. Talk to you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com. That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. To get a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, visit my website or you can find it on Amazon or other retailers. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, stay agile.